Hey everybody, welcome back to the Simpleton Podcast. I am so excited to be here. Um, I am your host, Pastor JJ the Simpleton. As you know, this podcast was created for two reasons. First, as a place to post sermon content for people uh, to use in order to grow closer to Jesus. But also, this is a place to discuss complicated or uh, tough subjects in a simple way. As I mentioned last time, October is launch month, which is so much fun. We are releasing a full sermon series every week. This week, we're going to release three episodes, one every day. Um, and then next week we're going to have four episodes. The week after that we'll have four episodes, just a whole bunch of content and sermon series to get us started and help you hopefully grow closer to God. But I always want to mention stuff like this, you know, podcasts where you can access a big pile of sermons, they do not and cannot replace involvement in a local church. So as much as I hope these episodes connect you to Jesus and help you grow closer to God, please, please make sure you're connecting to a local church. Uh, today's sermon is part two in this series that we started last time called We Are the Church. Uh, this week is about teaching, and we're taking a look into, I believe it's First Timothy and First Peter. And I'm using the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, this month. Uh, we rotate translations, but you could probably follow along with whatever translation you prefer. So grab your Bible, and here we go. C.S. Lewis once told a story about a time when he was speaking at an event, and he was talking about theology, and a fellow stood up at the event, and he was an old, hard-bitten officer, and the officer said, I have no use for that stuff. Now, mind you, I'm a religious man. I, I know that there's a God. I have felt him when I was out there in the desert alone at night. He's a tremendous mystery. But that's why I don't believe all the neat little dogmas and formulas about God, right? To anyone who has met the real thing, it feels so petty and pedantic and unreal. Now, on the one hand, C.S. Lewis admitted he was like, I agree with you. Right? I think you probably did have a real experience of God out in the desert. It's kind of like standing on the shoreline of the ocean. right? And you dip your toes in the water and the sand and you can feel the wind and the waves and it's really amazing. But then you turn around and you look at a map of the ocean. Now, turning from the real waves to a little bit of colored paper feels like you're moving from something that's real to something that's less real. And theology, all those teachings about God, they're a lot like a map. And they, they don't feel as real as that authentic experience of God that we find in those rare moments in life. Just like the map doesn't feel as real as the ocean. But there's two things we need to remember. Number one, the map is what hundreds and thousands of people have learned from being out on the ocean. In that way, the map actually has behind it masses of experience just as real as what we experience when we stand on the beach. The map fits it all together. And the second thing we need to realize is if you want to go anywhere, the map is absolutely essential, right? Teachings about God theology or doctrines, whatever you want to call it, they are not God. They are only a kind of map. But you need that if you want to grow. You see, what happened to that man in the desert might have been really exciting. I felt an experience of God, and that's really powerful, but nothing comes of it. It doesn't lead you anywhere, and so that's why people like it. Right? It's kind of this vague New Age religion, these exciting emotional experiences, but they're all thrills and no work. But you're never going to figure out how to get to Africa or to England or anywhere else by simply standing on the shore and watching the waves. As Lewis says, he says, you will not get to Newfoundland by studying the Atlantic from the shore, and you will not get to eternal life by simply feeling the presence of God in the flowers or in the music. Today is part two in our sermon series called We Are the Church. And every week we're looking at what it means to be a part of this group of people. And last week we got started by talking about fellowship. Today we're going to look at the importance of teaching. As C.S. Lewis says, everybody reads. Everybody hears about things and discusses them. Consequently, if you do not have theology, that will not mean that you have no ideas about God. It will mean you have a lot of wrong ones. Bad, muddled, out-of-date ideas for many ideas uh, that are out there about God, which are trotted out as novelties today, 
are simply the ones which real theologian tried centuries ago and rejected. Look, if we want to grow in our connection with that thing that is out there, it's time to look at the map. Now, we're going to jump into 1 Timothy, and we'll move over to 1 Peter, but I wanted to set it up a little bit to see what we're getting into. You see, these books of the Bible, like most of the New Testament, they are written as letters written to leaders in the early church. Basically, this is like a pastor reaching out to another pastor in a church across town or in a different town, and they're showing them how to handle some conflict. Some people call these the pastoral epistles, which is just a fancy way to say letter to a pastor. And the issue of false teaching, it comes up over and over and over in the Bible. This was, uh, there, there have always been conflicts of doctrine in the church. So let's dive into Timothy. And right at the beginning of the book, it says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of our God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the face, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul, there's this guy Paul, and he's writing the letter to his buddy Timothy, who's leading a church out in a town called Ephesus. And basically, Paul starts out by saying, hey, Timmy, you know, like, miss you, bud, hope you're doing okay, right? Like, it's just kind of this little greeting. And then he says, I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach anything, any different doctrine, and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculation rather than divine training that is known by faith. He says, Tim, You've got to stay there and protect them from a different doctrine. Now, I've said that word doctrine a couple times, and maybe we don't know what that is. But basically, doctrine, let me lay it out like this. Doctrine is the map that we follow to discover who God is. That's what doctrine is for us. And Paul's telling the people, you've got to stick to the map. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. And there are teachers out there who are selling a false map. They're selling an off-brand map of who God is. And so Paul says there are people teaching a different doctrine, and they do this thing where they occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculation. So basically, they're just making stuff up, right? They're just looking back at history and, and connecting the dots with weird genealogies and just making things up. So these teachers come in, and they're like, yeah, all right, so you've got the Bible, and you've got Jesus, and you've got thousands of years of church history and the map of God that has been created to help people grow closer to God, but I have a shiny new opinion over here, and I want to add that to the map. And it's like they're looking at the map, right? And it's just like, well, I think it would be more fun if we had a river over here, right? And I think the canyons should be over here. And this mountain, that's an Old Testament mountain. Let's just erase that mountain. We don't need that mountain anymore. And I think the ocean should be shaped like this. And so these teachers, they come in and they start messing with the map. And Paul says, no, doctrine is not a wish list. It's not a a, a hope a description of what we want God to be like. It's a map of the reality that is out there. Look, let me put it like this. If God was this made-up thing, right? If we were just making up God to make people feel better, if he truly was an opiate to the masses designed just to make people nice and to hold society together to make a couple of church leaders rich, right? Like if that's what God was, well then sure, just Change him. Make him to be whatever you want him to be. Redraw the map so that it fits nicely in the culture. It'd be a lot easier for me. I would never have to be mad at anyone. I could just make it to be whatever I wanted it to be. And honestly, that's what I see with a lot of the false teachers that are in our modern world. Right? There's a lot of people, they just don't believe anything is out there. So they just kind of make it to be whatever they want. They make God to be what they want. But if God is a real thing... If the divine is actually out there, we don't get to make the map, right? We don't craft God in our image. All we get to do as finite, limited, mortal humans is respond to what we've discovered about God. And, it wasn't, and in case I wasn't clear, God has been revealed to us in two ways. 
God has been revealed to us through his word. And when that phrase, that God's word, means two things. Number one is the person of Jesus. That's how God has been revealed to us. And the other is the scriptures, God's word, the Bible, that has been given to us. And Paul, he keeps going in verse 6, and he says, oh, Timothy, verse 6. He says, some people have deviated from these, and they turned into meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make assertions. So basically, Paul says, Tim, you got to stay there. you got to keep them on track because these new teachers that are coming in, they don't know what they're talking about, and they don't know what they're saying. They're just making things up, and you've got to stick to the map. If your goal is to connect to God, you've got to stick to the map. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, before we move over to Peter, you might have noticed I skipped a verse. So we got to go back to verse 5. Because all this stuff about doctrine, the map of God, and false teachers, all of it is for one reason. It says in verse 5, But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's why we're doing this. To find a love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's our goal. That's our target. That's what we're shooting for. And so we move over to 1 Peter, and it's a, a different letter for a different situation, but it's very similar. Peter is writing a letter to Christians in the early church, and he writes it out in chapter 2, verse 1. And he says, oh, that's because that's I'm in the wrong book. Peter's in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Now, my goal was to read more than just one verse at a time, but I got to stop there. He says, rid yourself of all these toxic traits, right? And, and I know we're talking about teachers and doctrines and all this stuff, but this is for everybody, every Christian out there. We have to get rid of these nasty traits. He says, malice and guile. I don't even know what guile is, but it doesn't sound like a cupcake, right? I mean, guile, insincerity, envy, and get rid of all slander. Now, I want to zoom in on those last two because envy and slander, those two go together. <sighs> Avoiding false teachers and sticking to correct doctrine, that's very important, especially in the modern church because there's all kinds of alternatives out there. But I have noticed a trend in the Christian church. As Christians, as a church, we do this thing where all the other churches in town, we don't view them as brothers and sisters we look at the other churches in town and we see them as what? As competition. Oh, that church over there, right? That, that church. And sometimes in that competition, we become envious, right? Oh, that church over there, they have a bigger building. That church over there, they got a better preacher. That church over there, they got a better children's program. They got better, uh, you know, they got whatever it is. They have more people. And then that envy that goes on between churches, it turns into slander, right? Well, all right, maybe they might have a nicer building, but you know there are a bunch of false teachers over there, right? This is what churches do. They, like, attack each other because they, they just want a reason to not like those guys over there. Now, of course, there are moments in a church when they are teaching the wrong stuff and they got to be held accountable. That does happen. But a lot more commonly, it is our inability to cheer for our brothers and sisters in other churches that lead to false accusations of false teachers. Now, I haven't been to every church in Flushing, but I have visited a whole bunch of them. I join them for worship on Sunday. When I take a vacation and I'm not here on a Sunday, I'm going to worship God somewhere. So if I'm on a vacation somewhere, I always go to church. And if I'm in town, I go check out one of my brothers or sisters who are in ministry. I go worship in their pews. I love sitting with my family in church. And I got to tell you, Flushing is blessed with great churches. There are great churches all over this town, fantastic preachers, godly leaders who are doing the best they can with the programs and the people they got. They are loving people, they are loving God, and they are showing people the map of God. Now, a little bit, I'm up here, like, nervous to say that, right? Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I admit that there are other good churches in town, what's going to happen? 
Everyone's going to leave this building, and they're going to go over to that building, right? And that's terrible. And doesn't that show my heart, though? Doesn't that show my fear? And it shows me that I've lost sight of the purpose of the church. Like Peter says, we got to rid ourselves of this mindset. we got to unlearn all the bad habits of competition. My goal will never be to get people from other churches to come to this church. That's never going to be the reason we do what we do. My goal is only ever, for every single person that walks through the door, my goal is to show them the map, to help them discover the presence of God, no matter what their past is. And here's why. Verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, it's a little bit weird, but the metaphor here is a baby longing for its mother's milk. And the presence of God should be for us like when a baby finally gets mom's milk, right? The presence of God should be nurturing to us, sustaining for us, satisfying for us. And I know it's strange, but Peter says, you got to taste and see that the Lord is good. Let the presence of God fill you and satisfy you in a way that nothing else in the world can satisfy you, like a baby who wants its mother's milk. Now, I'm going to try really hard to get through this metaphor without saying the word boob in my sermon, okay? But I am a father of three little boys, and they were all breastfed. And I'll tell you, when they wake up in the middle of the night, or from nap time, or from whatever, they don't want dad, right? Like, I, I know my children love me, right? They promised. But uh, just, I, I am not, we all, we all know who the favorite is. Right? Can we just admit this? We know that this is how it works with babies, right? And so I, how do I say it? I don't have the proper equipment that they are looking for, right? I don't have what they want. And so on those nights when I choose to serve my wife and I hear the baby crying in the monitor and I say, no, 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 baby, you stay in bed. I will go get him. And I will take care of him, and I, I grab the pacifier, and I walk into the baby's room like a rock star husband. I can't fully express the disappointment in my kid's eyes when it's me who walks in the door, right? Like, they just look at me like, what are you doing in here? <laughs> and, and a pacifier, not even a bottle, Dad? Get with the program. Come on, man. This is how my children talk to me. And so, um, no, but that's perfectly natural, isn't it? Like, that makes total sense, right? It's, it's the most natural thing in the world for a baby to want mom's milk, to want nourishment. And that's what Peter's getting at here. He says, we should want God. We should chase God. We should cry out for God like a baby longing for pure spiritual milk. You see, what we need to understand is that God is the thing that is missing from your life. So many people out there are living these, like, empty lives. And, like, you can make it look good on the outside. It's like a, it's like a house of cards. And you get really good at making it look shiny, at dressing it up so that everybody thinks it's normal. You get really good at the balancing act of getting your life to stay upright, every card balanced perfectly. But then you live terrified waking up and moving through every day, worried that a simple gust is going to knock your entire life askew. Just one big problem is going to ruin your entire life. And so to make ourselves feel better, we fill that void inside of us with stuff. Right? We all have this void, and we fill it with stuff. We get super involved in our job, or we obsess over going on the best vacations, or we pour ourselves obsessively into our kids' activities, or we volunteer, we get super political, we binge watch TV, we have to fill every space between the cards with anything and everything we can think of. We are addicts, searching, desperate to fill that relentless urge with every drug and havoc and time-consuming nonsense that our society could possibly feed us, because we know deep down inside, we know there is something missing in our lives. And all this 
all this facade, this face that we put on for the world, it's this close to collapsing. It's this close to crumbling. But here's what I need you to hear this morning. All of it. All this stuff that we fill our life with to keep the house of cards upright, all of it is nothing. All of it is empty and meaningless, and you don't need it. What you need is time with your creator. You need time with the one who made you, who gives your life purpose, and he loves you, and he protects you, and he fulfills you. Like a baby needs its mother's milk, we need the presence of God. God is the thing that is missing from your life, the living rock that gives you a foundation. You see, I thought I became a pastor to help people, right? When I was in seminary and I was looking at it, it seemed noble, right? I was going to have this career where I basically got to, like, love people professionally. That's what I thought my gig was going to be. I'm just here to fix all your problems, right? Like, I'm just a pastor. I'm just going to fix everything, but then as I moved in the church, in this denomination, and in the whole modern church, I started to notice all the idols. And I started to realize the depth of the emptiness of the people that I was interacting with. And I started noticing all the things that we were worshiping instead of worshiping Jesus. Like knowledge. That's huge in our culture right now. We worship knowledge. I mean, so many of us think, if I could just get a little bit more knowledge, if there was a little bit more knowledge in our society, then I would finally be satisfied. Then I would finally be fulfilled, and I would finally have everything I want. We have more knowledge in the modern world than ever before. Did it work? As a society, did it work? I got more knowledge in my pocket than my brain can ever hold. Did it work? Am I satisfied yet? As a society, we drug ourselves both legally and eagerly, illegally just to get through the day. Depression is at an all-time high. Suicide is at an all-time high. Drug abuse is at an all-time high. And it's not just knowledge. It's everything we use to fill that hole. The God of technology. Right? I just, I just need a little bit more tech. I just need a little bit more comfort and convenience in my life. A little more technology will solve all my problems. And then, then we say the God of money. I just need a little more money. I just need a little bit more stuff. I just need a little The God of politics. I just need my team to win a little more. We got to get more votes. We got to get our, more of our laws, get more political victories. And as I move through the church, I realize all these gods, all these idols and false gods all around us. When I became a pastor, I thought I was going to, like, use God to fix your problems, right? Use God like a tool to get in there, and I'll just let me put a little Bible study in your life and a little volunteering, give you an awesome worship experience, and I will solve all your problems with a godly-type answer. I was trying to solve people's lives with religion, but as I've continued in ministry, I've realized even the construct of religion was not enough. As great as church can be, it will not fill the void. It will not shake that urge. It will not satisfy you. To aim all the religious stuff at your life, to aim it at your problems, to use God as a self-help guru for your problems, it's not enough. You don't need religion. You need God. You need the presence of God dwelling in your life. A treasure that lives in your heart and is so valuable you would give up anything to just have a little more Jesus, to get a little closer to Jesus. God saved me from the idol of religion by coming up into my life and showing me that he was real. He's actually there and he can do the same in your life. We don't use God for our purposes. We need God to satisfy a longing that nothing else in this world could ever come even close to filling. There's an old catechism called the Heidelberg Catechism. And the question they ask is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer, I, I wanted to put it on the screen. My only comfort in life and in death, is that I am not my own, but I belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, that he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. 
He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. That was written in 1563. There's nothing wrong with the map. The good news today is that God has provided everything you need to learn about him. He created you for this purpose. He created you and he knows you. He knows all about you. He has put the tools that you need in life so you can grow closer to him, so you can glorify him. Not a hair on your head will fall without God knowing about it all your life works together for your salvation. God has put together everything in your life. He has crafted the entire human experience so that, you, so that he would be the answer to the question of your heart, so that you would cry out to him like a baby searching for mother's milk. God has provided everything you need to learn about him. He gave us the presence of Jesus He gave us the scriptures. He gave us teachers. He gave us brothers and sisters, people to serve with, to learn with. All of it so that God could save you. I just really have one piece of application, one challenge for you. First, taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't try to use God for your self-help purposes. Don't try to erase the parts of the maps that you don't like. Just call out to God like a baby. Let his presence fulfill each and every single one of your deepest desires. Let God comfort you. Let God rock you to sleep, hold you in his powerful arms. If you don't know God, like maybe you're a first-time visitor or you're a guest or something, and maybe you're nervous. Like maybe you're sitting there today thinking, well, okay, yeah, sure, you say God loves me, but if he knew me, right? Like if he knew this about me or if he knew that about me, there's no way God would love me. That's the most common thing I hear when I start talking about God's love. So let me show you one more piece of the baby metaphor. The baby doesn't deserve the mother's milk. The baby didn't do anything, good or bad, that would deserve the goodness of being nourished. What I'm trying to say is there's no test, right? There's no qualification for that baby to be nourished, right? There's, it's not like the doctor pulls the baby out and then says, well, only if it's really cute am I going to let you feed it. That's not how it works. That baby has been crafted. It has been designed that way. The baby comes out screaming into this world because the world is cold and bright and scary, and it has been crafted and created to be fulfilled by its mother's milk, by that skin-to-skin contact. You are the same way. You have been created. You have been crafted by God in such a way that only God can satisfy your deepest need. We come into this world or we walk through the doors of a church screaming. And maybe some of us today were screaming on the inside. If only you knew this about me or if you knew that about me. We scream because the world is cold and it's bright and it's scary and we need God. Look, I'm not up here to tell you about God's grace because you deserve it. I'm telling you about it because you need it. You won't survive without it. Whether you're a brand new, first-time visitor, or you've been sitting in the same seat for decades, it's the same level of good news. You need God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. If you stand on the shore and you dip your toes in the sand, You can experience the ocean. And in the same way, in those rare moments throughout life, you can experience the presence of God moving in your life. But if you want to grow, if you want to grow closer or get anywhere in your faith, we got to pay attention to the map. So let me see, let me leave you with this. The Word of God, and when I say that, I mean the Bible and the person of Jesus. It gives us this incredible map You call it a theology, call it a doctrine. And the reason they did that is because there is an incredible God out there 
and he loves you, and he is what you need. So come close, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. All right, this has been another episode of the Simpleton Podcast. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, As always, I do want to throw out a note that if you like supporting Christian content like this, please click subscribe, uh, leave a review, spread the news, whatever they do. Uh, uh, You know, spread the news. Hey, look, there's another way to grow closer to Jesus by listening to this silly little podcast from a Simpleton Podcaster. Um, Until next time, I will be looking forward to the future. Bye, everybody.